As a kid, Frédéric Gerard witnessed the arrival of home computers. At the age of 15, he bought himself the Atari 800XL. Like many others, this is where he first got in touch with the basic programming language. He fiddled around a bit with code and made a few programs on tape. When word got out about the new Amiga 500, he fell in love. This was his dream machine, but he could not afford it. A year later, at the age of 16, he got a student job during the summer holidays to earn enough cash to buy the next best thing, the Atari ST. But the ST was a more than capable machine, especially in the hands of an experienced coder, and this became apparent when Frédéric saw all those amazing demos from different crews. He wanted to do this as well, and dived straight into 68K Assembler. And when the Union demo was released in 1989, he was completely blown away and he knew just what he had to do. He joined the demo group Equinox with the sole purpose of exchanging know-how and enhancing his coding skills. He wanted to be able to optimise his routines as much as possible and push the limits of the Atari ST. A little later, Frédéric, or Gégé, as he was called in the scene, and two other Equinox members abandoned the group to start working on a new project called TEC. The TEC demo, released in April of 1990, was completely coded and designed by Frédéric, and it was a great opportunity to show his skills. Around that same period, one of the biggest French gaming magazines called Génération 4 was about to start a demo contest. The first prize was an Atari TT. Frédéric joined the contest and thus the Gen 4 demo was born. With this demo, he went all out. Not only did he do all of the coding for the screens, he also programmed a small homemade sound tracker tool, which was used for the digital intro tune and he created a music file converter which turned files of the standard MIDI format into YM chiptunes. He also coded a small horizontal shooter hidden within one of the many screens of the demo. In the end, JJ became fifth in the contest. Frédéric was ambitious and wanted to become a professional game programmer, so it was this demo that he sent with a letter of motivation to software company Titus. And eventually, that little shoot 'em up he created within the demo got him an interview at the Cons company. By July of 1990, Gégé became an official Titus employee. He immediately noticed things had to go fast at the company. During his first months, he had to prove himself by converting five children's educational games to the ST and Amiga, titles like the Labyrinth games. He only got 15 days to a month for each title to complete the job, while at the same time learning the C programming language. It was poorly paid and not fun at all. But once completed, the more exciting stuff finally started and Frédéric was assigned to convert Titus's first big movie license, Dick Tracy. Titus had high hopes for the game, but it eventually bombed. Behind the scenes, work had begun on another big movie license project called The Blues Brothers. This game, released in 1991, placed Titus back in the spotlight. It was a huge success and the first game for them that was converted to a Nintendo system. This game engine would be reused a year later in 1992 in their other major platform release called Titus the Fox. But even with the success of these games, Eric wanted to keep the momentum going and thought it was time to revive the Crazy Cars series for a new entry. At first, Jean-Michel Masson was assigned to the task and since he wasn't able to refine the gameplay mechanics the way he wanted during the development of Crazy Cars 2, he felt up to it, but was eventually taken off the project prematurely, as he had started to take on more managerial tasks within the company. Eric turned to Frédéric and asked if he knew how to make a scrolling routine for a road on the Atari ST. 
After a week working from home, he returned with a demo of a scrolling road based on HBL interrupts, a technique he had used during his demo scene years. So a team was formed and brainstorming over the new game began. The crossroads of the previous game were canned. Like in the first instalment, opponents were added as well as police cars. They came up with an idea to earn money and improve your car as you won races by placing bets with the opponents. And so, the project started. Frédéric wanted to fully optimise his code in Assembler, but since things needed to go quick, a lot of the work of Jean-Michel got reused. Improvements, however, were needed. To keep the game fluent and smooth on the Atari ST, as this instalment of the trilogy had more sprites on screen. He also had to use the C language as well, so converting to other systems like the Amiga was much easier. The specific routines on the Amiga were mainly created by Richard Hooper, with Titus newcomer Rob Stevens, who would do some impressive work on the game Prehistoric Man later on. Richard also implemented the betting system in the game, and he composed the music, which was later converted to the ST using Frederic's conversion tool he made for the Gen 4 demo. In the graphics department, Florent Moreau got help of Francis Fournier, Didier Carrère and Lies Belladoni, who all had worked on the Blues Brothers or Titus the Fox. And this shows, as Crazy Cars 3 was a great looking game. As always, the graphics were done in deluxe paint on the Amiga. In the end, Frédéric was very proud of the work he'd done on the game. One of the biggest challenges was keeping the frame rate up. There were many sprites, all the cars and scenery elements. In addition, these had to be sorted constantly to display them in the right order, and sometimes some of them had to be hidden behind the road when going uphill. So there was masking applied to them. He also created a course editor in Simple Basic to generate small files, defining the sequence of turns, slopes, ramps, colour palette, gradient, weather and background decorations and he did push the limit of the Atari ST version by displaying more colours thanks to the HBL interrupt, which allowed you to define a new palette of 16 colours for each line on the screen. By May of 1991, Frédéric had finished his work on the game, and he left Titus a month later to start his military service. When he returned in July of 1992, he did some final bits, but got assigned to start working on the Super Nintendo version. Crazy Cars 3 was released in the second half of 1992. The box art was designed by Patrick Lopez, this time displaying the Lamborghini Diablo that was featured in the game. It was very well received on the Atari ST and Amiga, and to this day is considered one of the best arcade racers on the platforms, and a fierce competitor to the Lotus series. Conversions to the Amstrad, DOS and even the Game Boy were also made. The Super Nintendo version had to be completely recoded in Assembler because the C language wasn't supported. The console also had dedicated coprocessors for sprites and scrolling. Everything had to be rewritten by Eric Caen and Frédéric. On the SNES, Crazy Cars 3 had evolved. Titus managed to get an official license and the game was rebranded as Lamborghini American Challenge. A multiplayer option, featuring split-screen modes, was also added. Once released, Eric asked Frédéric to do an Amiga version, which he managed to complete. Work on an ST version had also started, but it was too slow. It would have needed many optimizations, and there was no time, as Frédéric was already assigned to convert in Prince of Persia 2 for the SNES in partnership with Psygnosis. This was the last game he ever coded. The complete Titus story is an intriguing one that goes beyond the scope of this video. At the top of its game in the year 2000, Eric and Hervé's empire had become the 12th biggest video game company in the world, with a revenue of $175 million. It bought studios like Digital Integration, Interplay, Palace Software and Virgin Interactive. 
However, the crazy period represents its most exciting area, but unbiased of course. And that's it for this time. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay Atari. <laughs>